When you look at the seas and oceans on a map, you might think that they just flow into each other. Like there's really only one big ocean and people just arbitrarily gave different names to its different parts. Well, guess what? You'll be amazed at how much more substantial the borders between them actually are. For example, the border between the Pacific and Atlantic oceans is like a literal line between two different worlds. It looks like the two oceans meet at an invisible wall, which does not let them flow into each other and mix their waters. Why on earth does that happen? Obviously, there's no actual invisible wall inside, and water is just water. So what could be interfering with its mixing? Well, the thing is that water isn't just water. There can be different kinds. The Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans have different densities and chemical makeups, the level of salinity and other qualities. One can see by their color that they are far from the same. Borders like this, between two bodies of water with different physical and biological characteristics, are known as halophiles. Jacques-Yves Cousteau discovered one of them while he was deep diving in the Strait of Gibraltar. The layers of water with different solidity looked like they were divided with a transparent film, and each layer had its own distinct flora and fauna. Haloclines appear when water in one ocean or sea is at least five times saltier than in the other. You can create a halocline at home if you pour some seawater or colored salty water in a glass and then add some fresh water on top of it. The only difference is that your halocline will be horizontal and ocean haloclines are vertical. For those of you who were paying attention in chemistry class, you might remember that if you have two liquids with different densities in one space, the denser liquid should eventually end up below the less dense one. By that logic, the border between the two oceans should look not like a vertical line, but a horizontal one. And the difference between their solidity would become less obvious the closer they got to each other. So why doesn't it work like that? Firstly, the difference in density of the two oceans is not big enough for one of them to sink down and the other one to rise up, but it is big enough to not let them mix. Another reason is inertia. There is an inertial force known as the Coriolis force, which influences objects when they are moving in a system of axes, which in turn are moving as well. In simpler terms, the Earth is moving, and all the moving objects on it are carried along acted upon by this Coriolis force, deviating slightly from their natural course. As a result, the objects on the Earth's surface don't move straight on, but deviate in a curve, clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. But because the Earth is moving slowly, after all, it does take the planet a whole day to make a full circle around its axis, the Coriolis effect isn't easy to observe in the short term it becomes easier to notice only in long-term intervals, like with cyclones or ocean flows. And this is why the direction of flows in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans is different. This difference also doesn't let them mix. Another important difference between these two ocean waters is the strength of molecule connection, or surface tensile strength. Thanks to this strength, molecules of the same kind hold on to each other. The two oceans have totally different surface tensile strengths, which also doesn't let them mix. Maybe if the waters were completely still, they could gradually start mixing over time. But as they flow in opposite directions, they just don't have time to do this. We think that it's just water in both oceans, but its separate molecules meet for just a very short moment and then get carried away with the ocean flow. But if you think that it's only the Atlantic and Pacific oceans that don't get along with each other, you are sorely mistaken. There's lots of places on the planet where the waters of the two seas or rivers don't mix, and for even more weird reasons. For example, there's a different kind of border called a thermocline. These are borders between waters of different temperatures, like between the warm water of the Gulf Stream and the much colder North Atlantic Ocean. But the most interesting kinds are called chemoclines. These are borders between waters having different microclimate and chemical makeup. The Sargasso Sea is the biggest and most widely known chemocline. It is a sea within the Atlantic Ocean, which has no shores, but is very obviously distinct. You can't not notice it. Let's now take a look at some other spectacular clines we have on planet Earth. And just as a heads up, I might mispronounce some of these names coming up, so please forgive me. First up, we have the North and Baltic Seas. These two seas meet near the Danish city of Skagen, 
The water in them doesn't mix because of different densities. Sometimes you can see the waves of the two seas clash into each other, making foam. Their waters do mix very, very gradually. That's why the Baltic Sea is slightly saline. If there had been no water coming to it from the North Sea, it would have just been a freshwater lake. Next up, the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. They meet at the Strait of Gibraltar and have both a different density and salinity. So there's two reasons their waters don't mix. Then we have the Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. The place where they meet is near the Antilles, and it's very easy to spot. It looks like someone has painted water with two different shades of blue. Another place where these two meet is Eleuthera Island of the Bahamas. The Caribbean Sea water is turquoise, and the Atlantic Ocean water is dark blue. There is also the Suriname River and the Atlantic Ocean, which meet near Paramaribo in South America. How about the Uruguay River and its afflux? These two meet in Misiones province in Argentina. One of them is claimed to be used in agriculture, and the other has an almost red tint to it because of loam during rainy seasons. Here's an interesting one. The Rio Negro and the Solimoes Rivers, part of the Amazon River. Six miles from Manaus in Brazil, the Rio Negro and Solimoes Rivers flow into each other, but don't mix for about 2.5 miles. The Rio Negro is dark and the Solimoes is light. They have different temperatures and speeds of flow. Then there's the Moselle and Rhine rivers, which meet in Koblenz, Germany. The water in the Rhine is lighter than that of the Moselle. Okay, how about three different bodies, like the Ilz, Danube, and Inn rivers? The junction of these three rivers is in Passau, Germany. The Ilz is a small mountain river to the left, the Danube is in the middle, and the Inn is a light river to the right. The Inn is wider than the Danube here, but is still its afflux. Take a look at the Alaknanda and Bhagirati rivers, which meet in India. Alaknanda is dark and Bhagirati is light. I really hope I got those right. The Irtish and Ulba rivers flow into each other in Kazakhstan, near the city whose name is Ust Kamenogorsk. The Irtish has clean water and the Ulba's water is cloudy. Moving further east, the Jianling and Yangtze rivers meet in Chongqing, China. I really hope that's close at least. The Jianling is clean and the Yangtze is brown. The Irtish River actually has another intersection with the Om River. These two rivers flow into each other in Omsk, Russia. Here, the Irtish is cloudy and the Om is pure and transparent. Speaking of Russia, the Chuya and Katun rivers meet in the Altai Republic. The water of the Chuya has an unusual cloudy white color here and looks dense and thick. The Katun, by contrast, is clean and turquoise. Flowing into each other, they form a single two-colored stream that does not mix for some time. On the other side of the globe, we have the Green and Colorado Rivers. The place of their junction is National Park Canyonlands in Utah, USA. The Colorado River is brown and the green is, well, green. The corridors of these rivers go through rocks with different chemical makeup. That's why they have such a big contrast of colors. Last but not least, we have the Rhone and Arve rivers. They flow into each other in Geneva, Switzerland. The Rhone is a pure river that flows out from the lakes of Geneva, while the Arve is cloudy and gets its water from the glaciers of the Chamonix Valley. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the strange clients on our beautiful planet, but as you can see, it happens a lot more often than you think. These are the kinds of environmental oddities that can really teach you about the way the natural world works, if you're curious enough, of course. Thanks for watching. Oh, and let me know how well I did with the pronunciations. Constructive feedback is always helpful. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.